That one shot ended the siege at the Battle of Adobe Walls. They measured the distance of that shot. It was seven-eighths of a mile. The longest shot ever recorded with a black powder rifle. Now, the Indian who was knocked off his horse was the Comanche medicine man by the name of Isate. And that's kind of ironic because Isate had convinced all those 1,200 warriors that his medicine was so strong, if they followed him into battle, the white man's bullets would not be able to find him. So when this white man's bullet knocked Isate off his horse, nobody ever paid much attention to Isate after that. And incidentally, Isate, translated into English, is cow droppings. <laughs> Only the droppings start with an S. Okay. And with a T. Yep. <laughs> and that's that's true story. Well, from where we are now to over the other end, the other side, the other wall, is right at a mile. So imagine seven eighths of a mile. That's how far that shot was. Wow. Yeah. Men sitting on a horse over there would be about that tall. It doesn't look like it. No, that's interesting. 300 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're 300 feet below the top and 500 feet above the floor. And over here, as far up the canyon as you can see, is Elkins Ranch. Wow, that's amazing. in this canyon. I've slept since they told me what they were, so I couldn't tell you. But I do know that the floor of the canyon, they say, was back in the time of the saber-toothed tiger, 250, 280 million years ago. The very top layer is only six foot thick, and that's since man has been on this planet. So this canyon represents 250, 280 million years. Wow. And one, one geologist told me that if you could take Paladura Canyon and set it inside the Grand Canyon, geographically you would have the entire history of the world in one place. Oh, that's interesting. I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but that's on my list. Oh, it's, it's a nice place. Yeah, I hear it's incredible. Yeah. You seen the skywalk? Have you guys been there? No. But have you seen the skywalk? Saw it on TV. No, I haven't. <laughs> Is that about the Most of them say they like this canyon better. Because? Because the Grand Canyon is so big, all you can do is look at it. Uh-huh. You can go in it, but it's just massive. Here, you feel like you're a part of this one. Mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of get up close and personal with it. And they say this has much more color. It's, it's more green and and so forth, where the Grand Canyon is kind of drab. Okay. Yeah, I know. I didn't realize that would be something. Is it the caliche that causes that color? Uh, the red? No, the red is, is, what... is actually iron ore. Okay, beautiful color. Uh -huh. The yellow out there contains a lot of sulfur. Now the white is uh, gypsum, I guess. Now there's another almost purple. They call it a lavender or something. Yeah, I, I can know. see that. Yeah. And and it's a clay, but I don't know what what mineral causes that color. formation they call lighthouse rock. Mm -hmm. Is that thing visible at all from this tour? Uh, not from this tour. One of our others, we can see it if it's a clear enough day. But even in the state park, it's a three hour hike to mm -hmm. it. That's what I heard. And, uh, yeah. yeah, she was on the phone earlier with somebody when we first got there and she said, no, it's a... So it's a mountain bike you need then. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. As she hung at the phone, I said, what the next question was, do you have motorized scooters? <laughs> so, we 
the Indians would go up there and stand lookout like arrowheads. And, smoke, uh, smoke signals, yeah. Smoke signals. Native yeah, American. Exactly. That's, that's how they would signal the village because the village was set up about nine miles down the canyon from where we are now. Oh, okay. Yellow Bear Blood. Yellow Bear was actually Quanta Parker's father-in-law. I thought that name sounded a little odd because I'm thinking there's no such thing as a Yellow Bear, so it's got to be Yellow Bear, and that sounded familiar. Yeah. In fact, Yellow Bear died in Fort Worth. Huh. Uh, Quanta and Yellow Bear went down there to the uh, Fort Worth Livestock Show. Mm -hmm. And Yellow Bear was up in years and he got tired. He wanted to go back to the hotel. So somebody took him back to the hotel. He went up to the room and at that time they had gas lanterns mm -hmm. instead of coal oil, you know. And he couldn't figure out how to turn them off, so he just blew the flame out. Laid down and went to sleep, and later, Quanta, when later, when Quanta came in later, Quanta walked in and laid down on the floor and uh, went to sleep. Well, somebody walking by smelled the gas, broke down the door, they pulled Quanta out, uh, he was unconscious, but he survived it. But Yellow Bear, who was laying on the bed, died from the gas. So, Quanta never went back to Fort Worth. And Quanta refused to sleep in a white man's bed because of that. But Quanta did become pretty famous after the Indians were put on the reservation. Uh, President Grant was in office at that time, and Grant sent an emissary out to Fort Sill to invite and accompany Quanta back to Washington. Quanta told this guy, he said, I don't want to go there. If your president wants to meet me, he can come out here. <laughs> so Grant decided he would. Well, General Sheridan, the man in charge of the Army, the man who believed the only good Indian was a dead Indian, he decided to go with Grant because he wanted to spend some time with the president. Well, as luck would have it, the people on the reservation had just built Quanta a big new house. Very, very nice house. And Quanta had spent a month or six weeks trying to decide whether he was going to live in that house or put his horses in it. He finally figured he had too many horses that wouldn't all fit in it, so he decided to live in it. So Grant and Sheridan came out and they came up to Quanta's house. Sheridan called Quanta Parker over. He said, Parker, I see you got a bunch of stars painted on the roof of your house. How come? Quanta looked at the general. He said, well, you've got stars on your uniform. How come? <laughs> Sheridan said, I'm a four-star general, highest ranking man in the military. That's one. Quanta said, I see four stars, highest ranking man. Well, General, I got seven stars on the roof of my house. I guess I outrank you. <laughs> Sheridan never spoke to Quanta Parker after that. And after Grant left office, Roosevelt took office. Roosevelt came out and had a meal with Quanta in his house. And after the meal, they were sitting out on the front porch, smoking cigars, visiting. Roosevelt was bragging on Quanta. He said, you know, Quanta, you've really come a long way for an American Indian. You've done really well. You learned the white man's language easily. You uh, were the first American Indian chief of police. You were the first American Indian judge. First American Indian ever elected to Congress. You own a printing company. You even own a railroad. You've done exceptionally well for an American Indian. But you know, Quanta, we believe you should abide by the white man's laws. Quanta said, well, what law am I breaking? Roosevelt said, well, you know, Quanta, the white man only has one wife. You have seven. Quanta said, well, you telling me I need to get rid of six of my wives? Roosevelt said, we believe that would be the proper thing to do. Quanta thought about it for a minute. He said, okay, 
You pick the six that have to go and you tell them they have to go. Quanta kept his seven lines. That's why there were seven stars on the roof of his house. Uh. Now, people ask me why did the Indians have more than one wife. I called a Comanche friend of mine, an elder, and I asked him the question, why? Why more than one wife? Part of his answer surprised me, part of it didn't. He said, think about it. Young men were killed in horseback riding accidents, buffalo hunts, and battle. There were more women than there were men. But a young man in our tribe would ask a young woman to marry him. And if she did, from then on, it was out of his hands. She decided how many wives he would have and who they would be. In other words, if she had sisters, nieces, aunts, cousins who needed a husband, she'd see they married her husband, so they were taken care of. Plus, the more wives a man had, the easier the work was for the women. They could share the work. So Yellow Bear, being Quanah's father-in-law, three of his daughters were Quanah's wives. The other four were cousins to those three sisters. Now, the first wife, she was the head wife. She was what the Comanche called the sits-beside wife. She's the one that made the decision. We know Quana. Quana's sits beside wife was a, a lady named Tonnersy. We know that because she's the only wife that he ever had a photograph made with. But we don't know for sure what his other six wives looked like. But we do know Tonnersy. She was his first wife, his sits beside wife. Incidentally, Quana and his seven wives had 25 children, four of which had blue eyes, which came from Cynthia Ham, Quanah's mother, who were direct descendants of Quanah Parker. And in fact, one lady is Quanah's great-great-granddaughter. She's in her 90s now. And I've had the pleasure of working with her several times. And most of the information, in fact, that I just told you about Guana came from her. There's a lot of information that, that has never been published about it. Well, this is E.J. Pearson Pass. E.J. Pearson is an uncle to the owner. And he loves to come out here and go through his pass. Best thing I can tell you is just hang on. <clears throat> oh, E.J. loves it. He says, you know, Whatever goes up, it's got to go down. <laughs> now I see why there's seat belts in here. <laughs> That's E.J. Pearson. All right. My favorite story about this ranch is one I'm not supposed to tell on this tour. But I don't always do what I'm supposed to, so I'm going to tell you. <clears throat> this happened in 1889 when Charlie Goodnight had this ranch. He and 12 of his hired hands were on this ranch up here on the flat, the prairie up there. And they were rounding up stray longhorns, doctoring them, branding them, turning them loose in the herd. A couple of strangers rode in on their horses. Well, these strangers stopped and they were talking to a couple of Charlie Goodnight's men. Charlie was standing over by the chuck wagon just watching. In a few minutes, he called a couple of his hands over. He said, boys, first chance you get, I want you to walk over yonder to them strangers. I want you to pull them off their horses and disarm them. Well, that only took a minute or two. Charlie's men nonchalantly walked over there, grabbed these fellas, threw them on the ground, took their guns away. Charlie Good and I walked over there. These strangers wanted to know what was going on. Charlie said, well, boys, let me explain this to you. He said, the first thing you need to know is I'm a Texas Ranger. That means I'm the nearest thing there is to law in these parts. And you boys are trespassing on my property. 
Now, I know you didn't cross the fence because I don't have no fence, so you didn't know you was trespassing. But that's okay. It's not why I had my men disarm One of them said, well, why did you? Charlie said, well, I'm getting to that. Don't rush me. He said, the next thing is you boys come riding in here and both of you wearing six guns. Now, I know there ain't no law against that. Everybody does. But it's the way you're wearing them, you see. You got them gun strap mighty low on the hip and you got the holster tied to your leg. Now, that's the way gunslingers carry their guns. But I want you to understand, boys, I ain't accusing you of being gunslingers or nothing. One of them said, well, you crazy old man, what are you accusing us of? Charlie Goodnight said, well, I just got a feeling you boys might be cattle rustlers. One of these strangers kind of grinned. He said, well, you can't prove it. Charlie Goodnight says, maybe not, but by golly, I'm going to try. He said, now, boys, I got 12 hired hands here. Best I recollect, it takes 12 men to make a jury. <laughs> By golly, we got us a jury. <laughs> he said, I'm gonna give this jury some evidence. And he said, I'll tell you right now, boys, if this jury finds you not guilty, we're gonna help you up, dust you off, put you on your horses, point you in the direction you wanna go, and send you on your way with our most sincere and heartfelt apologies. But if this jury finds you guilty, I'm gonna pass sentence. One of these strangers said, well, get on with it, old man. This ground is not that comfortable. Old Charlie Goodnight goes over to the horses these old boys were riding. He's looking at all the gear they've got. Both of them had blankets rolled up, tied behind the saddles. Charlie kept looking at one of these blankets. He finally said, you know, Boys, there's something ain't right with this blanket. Don't know what it is, but I intend to find out. So we untied that blanket, took it off from behind the saddle, rolled it open on the ground, rolled up inside that blanket was a running iron. A running iron was what cattle rustlers used to change brands on cattle back in those days. And back then, if you had a running iron, you were a cattle rustler. So, Charlie Goodnight's men took a look at this running iron. They discussed the situation for a second or two. One of them said, well, Colonel Goodnight, no doubt in our minds, these boys cattle rustlers. Charlie Goodnight said, well, boys, you've been found guilty. I sentenced you both to hang. Whoa. One of these strangers looked around, he kind of chuckled. He said, look around you, old man. Ain't a tree in this country big enough to hang a man from. Charlie Goodnight said, well, you know, you might be right. But it don't matter, we're gonna hang you anyway. So old Charlie pulled a chuck wagon over there. He unhitched the horses, raised the tongue of that chuck wagon up, and he hung them both right there on the tongue of that chuck wagon. <laughs> now, Charlie knew the word of this to get back to his wife, Miss Molly. And he knew she was going to be mad if he didn't do the only Christian thing a man could do. So he had his men dig a couple of graves right up here on the flat, and they buried those cattle roads. Normally, they'd have just left them for the coyotes and the, the vultures, but Charlie Goodnight buried them right back up here. The following year, 1890, one of Charlie's hired hands, a man by the name of Josiah Brown, walked up to Charlie Goodnight. He said, Colonel Goodnight, sir, you know I'm getting old, I'm getting long in the tooth, and I've been feeling poorly lately. I don't reckon I'm gonna live much longer. I have a favor to ask of you. Charlie Goodnight said, well, Josiah, what can I do for you? Well, old Joe said, well, Colonel, when I die, if it's okay, I'd like to be buried on this property. Charlie Goodnight said, well, Joe, that's not a problem. We can do that, but tell me, do you have any particular place in mind? Old Joe Si thought about it for a few minutes. He said, well, Colonel, I reckon you ought to bury me up yonder with them cattle rustlers so as I can keep an eye on them. <laughs> so they did. They buried old Joe Si right back up here by those cattle rustlers. And on one of our other tours, we go by that little graveyard. There's one headstone there for Josiah Brown. Those cattle rustlers didn't deserve a cross or a headstone. But, a little 
Stone Graveyard is listed in the Texas Historical Registry as the Rustler's Graveyard on Elkins Ranch. So that's a true story about Texas Panhandle justice back in the 1880s. In fact, old Charlie Goodnight, according to his great-great-granddaughter, once found a man on his ranch here and got to talking to the old boy. And the old boy was nice, he was friendly, and he said he was just passing through. Charlie Goodnight said, well, that's good. He said, I gotta tell you, just, just for your own knowledge, he said, you know, you could probably kill a man out here and get away with it if you had a good enough reason. He said, but if you steal a man's horse or his cattle, he said, we'll string you up every time. Because you might take a man's life, but you don't take his livelihood. And that's just the way Charlie Goodnight felt about it. I still wish we could string them up today and save us a bunch of taxpayer dollars. It's it, still a law on the books, Cody. Oh, yeah. You can still hang a man. Oh, yeah, Texas. you can here in Texas. In fact, the last hanging I understand in this state was back in 19, I think it was 1946. That was down around Abilene. There was an old boy, and this, this I know is a true story. A guy had been in prison for 12 years down in Huntsville. He started studying law while he was in there. He found a law in the Texas books that said when they, when they release you from jail, the state of Texas owes you a horse, a saddle, and a rifle. He demanded it. He said, it's law, it's on the books. You have to give me a horse, a saddle, and a rifle. So the day they let him out, they walked him right outside of Huntsville, led a horse up to him, handed the reins. Horse had a saddle on it. <clears throat> Man walked over, handed him a 30-30 Winchester lever action rifle. And as soon as he did, they rearrested him because it's a felony for a convict to own a firearm. So after 12 years in pen, they put him back in for 20 because he demanded that rifle. That point over there is Yellow Bear Bluff. If you look down from it, you see a big rock standing up there? Uh -huh. When the sun hits that rock just right, it looks like a big yellow bear standing there with one paw in the air. Cool. But it only looks that way from right in this area. But that's another reason we call that Yellow Bear Bluff. Oh. Well, there's one more story that I can tell you on this tour. And that's about the last battle in the Red River War, which was fought here. Right after the Battle of Adobe Walls, which was the last day of July and the first few days in August, the Kiowa Comanche and Southern Cheyenne came here to Paladira Canyon and set up their winter village about nine miles from where we are here. And General Sheridan about that time was real upset about the battle there at the Dobie Walls. So he called Lieutenant Colonel Randall Slidell McKenzie in his office. He said, McKenzie, I want you to go out there and find them Indians. I want you to kill them. McKenzie said, that's impossible, sir, for two reasons. One, we don't have enough men or ammunition to kill all those Indians. The second reason is we can find them, but we can't keep up with them. The Comanche Indians are the finest light cavalry the world's ever known. Sheridan said, well, I don't care how you do it. Just go out there and kill the ones you can. Put the others on the reservation. Open that country up for settlement. So McKenzie went down into South Texas, and he hired some Tonkawa Indian scouts. Well, those Tonkawa came up here and tracked the Comanche to this canyon. They led McKenzie and 700 troops of the 4th U.S. Cavalry to this canyon just after sundown on September 27, 1874. McKenzie's men started looking for a way down into the canyon. 
They finally found a buffalo trail that wound down the wall of the canyon. It was so narrow they had to dismount and lead their horses down single file. So they started down this, this buffalo trail between 10 p.m. and midnight on September 27th. By the time the sun came up on the 28th, they still weren't all down to the bottom. And some idiot shot and killed an Indian scout just about daybreak, which warned the village that the cavalry was coming. So most of the Indians just kind of vanished back off into the canyon. Some of the old men stayed in the village to fight. So when the cavalry reached the floor of the canyon, they mounted their horses, rode through the village, killed about 12 Indian men, old men. On the far side of the village, they rounded up 1,400 head of Indian horses. They drove those horses back through the village, burned the Indians teepees and winter supplies, then Mackenzie had his men drive those horses up out of the village, or up out of the canyon. He gave 400 head to his Tonkawa Indian scouts and sent them home. Had his men drive the remaining thousand head of horses about 30 miles south of here to a place called Tool Canyon, where he had his men shoot and kill those thousand horses. Without their horses, teepees, or winter supplies, that forced the Indians to go to the reservation. Now, I believe the outcome of that battle would have been different if Quanah Parker and all of his Quahati warriors had been in the village that day. But they weren't. They were about 85 miles southwest of here at a place called Muleshoe, Texas, doing some horse trading with some common cheros. So it was after, about nine or ten months after that, when Quana and his Quahati warriors finally gave up and went to the reservation. Eighteen seventy-four. Not that long ago. That's beautiful. So most of the history we know about this canyon is fairly recent history. But this is a nice little panoramic view of Alabura Canyon, or at least our, our little corner of it. different layers and colors in that. You see those all through this canyon. When Coronado was here, he said they reminded him of the skirts of the Spanish women wore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he called them Spanish skirts. Cool. Now, right up here, when we get to this little rise, I'll be able to show you the waterfall where we were standing earlier. Look in front of the jeep to see the big black streaks on the rock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the waterfall. That's where we were. What's the black from? Some kind of a mineral. I'm not sure. It does, but it's not. In fact, we've been accused of painting that on. Oh, really? <laughs> I said, yeah, right. I'm going to hang over the side of there. We can't paint the paint We were impelled down the side of that. Yeah, right. Uh, it's some kind of a mineral, I guess, that turn the rock that color. Huh. I wish these old canyon walls could talk. Oh, well, I bet they could tell some stories. Much better than stories I can tell. Anyway. Maybe not. I'd like to know more about this canyon before 1874. I'd like to know about all the many, many years that the Indians lived here. Charlie Goodnight said that his herd of buffalo 
he believed they were born in this canyon and died in it. He didn't think they ever left this canyon. Which actually makes pretty good sense because the canyon is 120 miles long. There's always water in it. Where there's water, there's going to be grass. So it wouldn't surprise me if those buffalo just roam back and forth through the canyon all the time. We do know that Charlie Goodnight started running longhorns in this canyon about 65 miles south east of where we are now. And so most of those buffalo were pushed up into this area. And we believe that it was a lot of his buffalo were kept here on this ranch. Is there any left at all? Yes, there are. Uh, about eight or nine years ago, they rounded up all the buffalo in Paladura Canyon. And of the 34 they tested, DNA testing, 32 were from Charles Goodman's original herd. Wow. So they took those buffalo down to uh, Caprock Canyon State Park, which is about 65 miles from us down there. I think I remember reading something about that. Yeah. About once a summer, I have to go down there and visit the buffalo. left on the ranch at all now? No buffalo here, no. I wish there were. Buffalo are one of my favorite, favorite animals. They're just uh, something about them. They're, they're so majestic. Mm -hmm. You know, they just, I don't know, fascinating. Dangerous, mm -hmm. but fascinating. Well, we got this one more little hill to go up. It may be a little bit rough and it may be a little dusty. If it gets too dusty, close your eyes. I may have to.